massive tree. It's a 600 year old tree. It's produced uh, many, many, many tons of fruit in its lifetime. So I wrote a booklet, a short book actually, it is free and open to the public, although if you uh, are willing to offer us donations and support, we do appreciate that. But in any case, uh, the website for that is there. It's conab.org, Fruit Book 9 PDF. Uh, you're welcome to download that and look at it. Uh, it will overlap a lot with what we're doing today, although I think, uh, I try to keep that booklet up to date, but what you're getting today is certainly the most up-to-date information I have. Uh, I do, uh, I'm not, I do a lot of things. As you, if you've been watching these webinars, you know, I work with green building, uh, renewable energy systems, solar electricity. Uh, so orcharding is only one thing I do. That said, I do try to stay in touch with people in my area, uh, other people who work with some, you know, email groups and groups on the web and whatnot. So um, the past few years, especially, I've been working a lot on Living Energy Farm, on the energy side of that project. Uh, but I try to stay in touch with what's going on in terms of the development of, of uh, horticultural issues. And it's interesting because in the United States, and I presume this may be true to some extent in the rest of the industrialized world, that there's a lot of money in grain and beef and in dairy products. There's not as much money in fruit. And the money that there is in fruit products is in very specific ones that have been marketed like apples, peaches, the common fruits. So in the U.S., we have the USDA, and they, do, they sponsor research programs, but they do not research, nor do they develop uh, new seed varieties or new tree varieties for offbeat fruits, so, you know, pomegranates or figs. Or, it's really left up to backyard gardeners or independent researchers, people who are working on this on their own, uh, to develop, to figure out what grows where, to develop new varieties. And that happens, and it is happening, but it's happening somewhat slowly. Uh, but that's okay. We're getting new varieties and new information all the time. So uh, particularly now growing any plant is naturally uh, you know, site specific. You can grow things, uh, different plants grow in different places. Now with annuals, if you're going to grow spinach, you can grow it in Miami, Florida, but you plant it in the wintertime. Uh, if you're growing it in Maine, you plant it in June or July. So with uh, annuals, you can adjust the, uh, the timing of your planting to uh, basically take plants far, far away from their natural habitat. You can grow cold weather plants in very warm places in the winter or hot weather plants in the middle of summer. You can't do that with fruit trees. Fruit trees are gonna sit there year round. So you are limited, uh, you have to grow things that will grow in your area. Uh, now again, my bias, uh, my experience and my bias is growing in hot, humid areas in the United States. So I'll talk about that. Uh, but you have to keep in mind where some of these fruit trees come from. Uh, the most popular fruits, and that includes apples, peaches, uh, cherries in particular, plums are a little more complicated, but in any case, these historically were evolved in uh, mountain climates in Asia and Europe, uh, 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 Asia in the broader sense, Asia the continent, uh, and they are, they're suited to dry summers, basically. They do not necessarily adapt well to hot and humid conditions. Now those plants have been bred over the years to make them commercially viable, to increase their productivity, but you can't, uh, you can't outrun evolution. So uh, the most uh, popular products, the most common fruit products, the problem is that people go to the grocery store and they buy a gala apple, say, and then they go, that apple tastes wonderful, and they go home and they think, boy, you know, I want to plant an orchard. So they go to the nursery, and even if the people who are running that nursery know better, and know that a gala apple is not going to grow well in your climate, they can't really tell you that because it's not that easy making a living running a nursery. It's not a big industry. There's not a tremendous amount of money in it. So they sell your, your gala apple, and it takes five or six or eight years before you realize that apple is poorly suited to your climate, at which point people kind of just get cynical and give up. So the point of this orchard planting process in general is to get you beyond uh, just plant what you're familiar with, plant what you bought at the grocery store. Do not do that. Uh, and here's why. Uh, so I'll read some of what I've written here. Commercial fruit is often not well suited to home growing because it's been bred to respond to chemical sprays and intensive management. It generally has uh, poor innate disease resistance and is attractive to insects. It has been get, bred to get ripe all at the same time. So commercial fruit, the stuff you buy in the grocery store, particularly apples, peaches, and cherries, the, the varieties are bred uh, for chemical management. They're bred for intensive management. They're bred to all get ripe on the same day. And for the most part, these are not great fruits for hot, humid areas. Uh, now, 
there, there's a long, long list of diseases and insects, dozens upon dozens, uh, that are the big variable for most uh, diseases and insects that attack fruit trees is heat and humidity. So it really is microclimate specific. Even in Virginia here where it's, it is hot and humid, there's a very big difference between being at the bottom of the mountain or the top of the mountain. Now we live near the foothills here. In other words, if we go an hour west of where I'm sitting, you're up in the mountains. Now mountains around here, this is not like the Rocky Mountains. It's not big mountains. These are, you know, two or 3,000 feet kind of mountains. But still, if you're up on a mountain or even a modest hill uh, in an open area where the air blows through, you've got a lot of air uh, movement uh, you, and you're going to have a lot less disease issues in the summertime. And historically, in fact, along the east coast that of the U.S., that's uh, the foothills from the foothills to the ocean is where they grew grain and, and other products. And then from the foothills up into the mountains is where they grew the fruit. Uh, that's because of that air movement. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a big difference, something to think about. Uh, I'm going to read some more here. You should also be aware that although the commercial nursery trade is made up mostly of honest people, they're selling to an uninformed audience that tends to make uh, choices based on appearance or experience. Because of this, most of the fruits and nuts sold by commercial nurseries will not make fruit in your yard. That's a hard thing for people to understand. And again, I'm not attacking the nurseries. They're in a hard spot. They do the best they can, most of them. Uh, but the big commercial nurseries especially, if you buy everything in the first 15 pages of that catalog, you're not necessarily buying good for food producing plants. And you're certainly not buying plants they're going to produce uh, in hot humid areas. Uh, so number two, even if a nur nursery says a plant is rated for your zone, quote unquote, that means nothing. Many plants will not produce in the rated zone. Uh, this is particularly true for cherries, for instance. Uh, cherries, you'll see all these catalogs that rate cherries and sweet cherries in zone seven, zone eight uh, in the United States, uh, down into the southeast. They just won't grow there or they might, you get, might, might get one good crop out of them. Uh, so uh, I've got a couple of pictures of different apple diseases, uh, fruit tree diseases here. These are some of the most common. Uh, apple scab, you can see that picture there. That's a, a disease that fatigues uh, apple trees. Uh, the picture on the lower uh, right, bacterial canker, it attacks, that disease attacks all stone fruits. It's particularly hard on cherries and peaches. Uh, and it's kind of like dragging a ball and chain. It just weakens the tree over time. So with a cherry tree, you might get one good crop or maybe you'll never get any, but the chances of that tree being a long-term productive tree, pretty slim. Now that's uh, true for sweet cherries and some sweet cherries have a little better bacterial canker resistance than others. Sour cherries are actually quite a bit better and we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so I'll finish reading here. There are a host of diseases and insects that thrive in stagnant and humid air, particularly in the central and southeastern United States where humid conditions prevail. Apples, peaches, plums, and cherries will struggle. They'll do better on a mountaintop or in areas with drier summers. Uh, here's some more of your most common fruit diseases. Uh, cedar apple rust on the left there, it attacks apple trees, June berries. Uh, it attacks a number of fruit trees. It's very sensitive to moisture. If you have a really wet, rainy spring, that stuff will devastate the trees. In a dry year, not so bad. So again, if you're on the mountaintop, you could have a tree that's susceptible to that disease and you wouldn't even know it necessarily. Brown rot uh, on the right there, it's particularly hard on peaches. Uh, if you have uh, the bugs and the brown rot work together, the bugs scratch the surface of the peach and then the brown rot gets into that scratch and rots them before they ripen. Um, again, a very moisture sensitive uh, disease. Uh, plum curculio is one of the worst insects we have in our area. There's codling moth and, and borers, there's a bunch of other insects. Uh, so I, I don't call apples trees apple trees in this part of the world, I call them applesauce trees because uh, unless you're willing to spray a lot of chemicals, and I should back up a minute and say that all of this is uh, predicated on the notion that you're not planning on spraying a bunch of toxic chemicals. If you are willing and able and happy to spray a bunch of toxic chemicals, then you can listen to another webinar. Uh, my whole orchard planting process is all about uh, planting things that you do not have to spray, that will produce a lot of food that you do not have to manage. You don't have to expose yourself and your fruit and your family to all this toxic mess. Uh, the picture on the right there, fire blight, that can devastate peach and apple trees, uh, pear and apple trees, I'm sorry. Uh, so for apple trees in particular, you want to, uh, those three diseases, uh, scab, cedar apple rust, and fire blight are the big three. You want trees resistant to those diseases. Uh, fire blight is really the big disease for pear trees. You want uh, trees that are resistant to that disease. And fortunately, there are a lot of varieties that are resistant. Now, you have to keep in mind that uh, disease resistance is, does not imply 
insect resistance. So if you have an apple that's immaculately resistant to cedar apple rust and scab and fire blight, fine, it's not going to have any resistance to codling moth or plum cacrulios or any of the other insects. Now I have noticed, and this is more based on experience than reading, that some fruit is a lot more attractive to insects than others. The plum curculio, for instance, is called the plum curculio because it loves plums. So that's its favorite target. It loves peaches. Well, the apples, it definitely, they definitely seem to uh, go after redder apples, although the ones in the picture here are green apples. I've noticed some green colored apples that have less insect damage. Again, that's a site specific thing. If you're determined to grow peaches and apples and whatnot, and just find stuff in your area that other people are growing. Uh, we're going to do a section next week on propagation. I'll show you how to graft. I'm hoping we can have a bunch of pictures, up close pictures of grafting techniques. I'll teach you how to graft and how to propagate trees by other means. Uh, so there are literally dozens of diseases that attack peaches, plums, and cherries. Uh, if you live in a cooler area, if you live on a mountaintop with excellent cross breezes, if you live in the western U.S. where summers are drier, these traditional crops will potentially produce without spraying. Uh, if you live in the mid-Atlantic or the south or any area with hot, humid summers, traditional fr fruits will probably not perform well. Uh, what gets left out of the USDA zone rating system? Spring frost resistance. Many Asian plants do not handle the oscillating temperatures in the U.S., particularly the eastern United States. Uh, I'm not a meteorologist, but something about the jet stream out there over the Pacific makes it wobble a lot as it comes over the eastern U.S. We have these crazy up and down temperatures, especially in the last few years. Well, a lot of our fruit plants that come from Asia uh, are not accustomed to that. Uh, kiwis, for instance, they're fantastic vine. We'll talk about those more in a minute. Uh, some of the uh, Asian walnuts, uh, they just bloom out too early. They bloom out really early because uh, we get a warm spell in March or April, even February, and they bloom out and then we get harsh cold temperatures and the blooms get burned off. Um, just something to keep in mind that that is not in any way incorporated into the USDA zone system. Uh, disease resistant, cherries that can survive in a particular zone, they never make fruit because they are fatigued by canker, canker and other diseases. Uh, so I had mentioned that already. So uh, I had created this chart. Uh, this is in that pamphlet, if you download that pamphlet. Uh, spectrum of disease and insect resistance to common fruits. So the fruits on the left side of this chart are the ones that are either not going to produce or going to require heavy management or toxic chemicals to produce. Uh, you know, it gets easier as you go to the right. On the far right side are the uh, fruits that will produce with little or no management. Uh, so you see on the left side, sweet cherries, apples, peaches, plums, apricots, basically the fruits that most people are most familiar with. You go all the way to the right side, persimmons, muscadines. What's a muscadine? Most people never even heard that word. Or well, persimmon, people, oh, I don't know about that. Pawpaws, rabbit eye, blueberries, eleagnus, jujubes, figs, pomegranates, cherry, passion fruit, kiwis, most berries. Uh, I'll hit the next column, blight-resistant pears, scab-resistant pecans, blight-resistant filberts, mulberries, currants, concord grapes, and uh, blackberries. So those are basically, you notice how long that list is. There are a lot of plants that have a strong innate resistance to, um, to disease and insect attack. Uh, so you're not restricted to just a few plants. You have a lot to choose from, uh, but it is not the most common fruits. I know I'm kind of the anti-apple guy in a way, and I do... I've done a lot of lectures and, and workshops teaching propagation orchard planting. Sometimes people get mad at me because they just planted their apple orchard. Or, you know, it's kind of, it's sad in a way because, you know, very few people plant anything. If they can plant something, it's usually flowers. A few more of those may plant vegetables. And it's very rare that people even plant fruit trees. And when they do plant them, they go out and buy an apple tree at the local hardware store or something. You really need to expand your perspective, uh, particularly in hot, humid areas, or even if you're in drier areas. Uh, what has been defined as food in industrial societies in the United States is what somebody has advertised. Somebody has spent a lot of money to promote as food. Uh, we could eat lizards and acorns. I'm not advocating that, but we could. Uh, but nobody's ever promoted those or figured out a way to make money off of them. Uh, people have figured out a way to make money off of wheat and beef and, and ice cream. and So that's what we eat. Uh, you take uh, uh, kiwis, for instance. That uh, traditionally, those were called uh, Chinese gooseberries. They were not known in the United States at all. A few decades ago, uh, the story, I'm not sure how the details of the story are true, but in any case, uh, the story is that there was a, a longshoreman strike on the West Coast, and a ship full of fruit was sitting there, and they couldn't unload it, and the fruit rotted, except they had some of these Chinese gooseberries that they were bringing into the Asian communities. And uh, the fruit distributor realized that these things were perfectly fine. They'd been sitting on the boat for weeks. 
And they realized, wow, we can distribute these all over the U.S. They have fantastic shelf life. So they hired a PR company, spent millions of dollars uh, to create the word kiwi uh, and to make this fruit known in the public mind. I think that was actually happening when I was a child because I remember these things coming on the market. So, you know, uh, that's the reason everybody eats kiwis. Nobody's ever done that for jujubes. You could just as easily. Jujubes have fantastic shelf life. They ship really easily. They're super easy to grow. But nobody's ever heard of a jujube. It's simply because nobody's ever spent the money to promote it. Uh, so there's not a lot of money in fruit. There's tons of money in dairy and beef and beer. Uh, so that's what people spend money advertising. There's very little money in fruit. And what money there is gets spent on apples, oranges, peaches, cherry, the, the, the fruits that people already know. So from a self-sufficiency perspective, what we're interested in, or the way I organize uh, my presentations, my booklet, uh, is by food value. I like food. I like uh, things that grow on trees that feed me. I, I like to have a full belly. Uh, and in that way, some of these other fruits are also much better than common fruits. But in any case, so the best uh, thing to fill your belly are nuts. Uh, our favorites are filberts, filberts and hazelnuts. Those two words are interchangeable for practical purposes. And pecans. Uh, uh, so protection from squirrels uh, should be your primary consideration in planting nut orchards. Make sure there's open grass between your nut trees and the forest. Uh, the best uh, single varmint deterrent uh, method out there, you can build squirrels and you uh, build uh, fences, do all that stuff. But, you know, between groundhogs, deer, rabbits, uh, squirrels, there's a lot of different things that can come chew on your trees and, and eat up your fruit. Uh, the single best deterrent is a dog. Now, I'm not saying you should get a dog just to guard your trees. But if you already have a dog or if you're planting a, an orchard in the future, the trick is to put the orchard somewhere close to your house and to make sure that those trees, that there's open grass between the trees and the forest and give your dog free run of the orchard. And that will keep the varmints off your trees. The deer, squirrels in particular, they're, they're cocky little fellas. They come up in your trees. You can't scare them away. You can either, you, you have to make them run on the ground. That's the only way you can scare them away or you can kill them. That's another option if you want to eat squirrels. Uh, but you can't intimidate them. With deer, even crows, smarter animals, you can intimidate you Intimidate them, you can scare them. Um, you can't do that with squirrels. You can't do that with uh, a lot of animals. In any case, uh, so filberts, uh, also known as hazelnuts, they are grown all over the world. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, again, if you're in one of the humid areas, uh, there are native filbert, filberts. In fact, uh, within 50 feet of where I'm, I'm sitting, there are a bunch of native filbert trees and they're tiny little nuts. They don't taste bad, but they're little things. Um, so, but on the East Coast, and again, in humid areas, uh, Eastern filbert blight is a devastating disease. Now, luckily, they have taken our American tiny little filberts and crossbred them with Asian big filberts or European big filberts to produce uh, blight-resistant filberts. Uh, there's, uh, Molnar is a uh, researcher at uh, Rutgers, I believe it is, and he recommended to me uh, uh, the, rec the varieties Yam Hill Slate and Jean used to be called Geneva as nuts that are both highly disease resistant and also produce a good, uh, large, uh, good tasting nut. Uh, now, come on, computer. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, I grew up in the South, in Georgia, uh, and in the South, uh, every farm has pecan trees around it. The big shade trees and the yard of pecan trees. Uh, uh, Pecan trees are fantastic trees, and you have to keep in mind, most people think of them as a southern tree, and they are, but it was actually the Native Americans who started taking them north and selecting for uh, uh, northern pecans. So now there are fairly two distinct families of pecan trees, and Missouri is actually one of the largest pecan-producing states in the country. It gets pretty cold in Missouri. So if you're, if you're in Missouri or Midwestern states or uh, you know, zone uh, five, six, you look at uh, the northern variety pecans. Uh, anywhere south of there, you look at the southern variety pecans. And if your commercial pecans are all, uh, all uh, sprayed with a fungicide uh, to control pecan scab, uh, another very moisture uh, sensitive uh, disease. So if you're in a really dry area, maybe you can uh, plant scab susceptible trees. If you're in a humid area, you want scab resistant trees. And there are a bunch of those to choose from. Uh, pecan trees are male and female. Uh, there are some. Now, male and female in plant world is a lot more complicated than in animal world. In plant world, in, in animal world, only females make uh, offspring uh, with the input of a male. Uh, in plant world, some males don't make fruit. Some of them do. Uh, most males, if they do make fruit, are self-fertile. And most of the time, when they call a plant female, they mean that it needs to cross-pollinate with a male. 
Uh, so plant world has got all sort of, of shades of gray in between male and female. But in any case, if you're going to plant, if you're going to plant a non-sprayed orchard in a hot, humid area of a bunch of pecan trees, you would want scab-resistant trees, and you would want a mix of male and female trees. Uh, and yes, well, okay. Uh, the only almond that I know of that will grow on the East Coast is one called Hall's Hardy. It is a lovely tree. It's actually a peach almond cross. It's beautiful in springtime. These are uh, uh, the blossoms you can see, fantastic, beautiful blossoms. Um, and the only sad thing is they're not reliable producers. Uh, there's quite a bit of variability. If you look at fruit trees over like a 20 year span, you know, some, some of my pear trees make fruit 19 years out of 20. It's just a really a rare event when they don't have a good solid crop. Um, persimmon trees are that way if they're in the right zone or in the right area. Hall's hardy, uh, maybe one year and three. Uh, that's, so they're still worth having in my book because it is a fantastic nut, but it's not super reliable. And it's more of a, a delicacy or something to add to your, to your diet rather than something to be a, a foundation of your diet. Uh, Hall's hardy almonds, as with all nuts, are improved quite a bit if you let them sit around and age a bit after they are uh, picked. Uh, it's basically a peach tree with a peach pit that has an edible almond in it. They need a good nut cracker, but I like them, they're good nut. Uh, now, other nuts to grow or other nuts to consider uh, depends on where you live. Chinese chestnuts have a wide geographical range. Uh, they're not as oily as other nuts, not as rich. Uh, they're one weakness from a self-sufficiency perspective. They're pretty reliably productive and disease resistant. They're good trees. Uh, but they don't store long term. You know, with a, any other nut, you can put it up for certainly months and sometimes even years and the nut will preserve itself. Can't do that with Chinese chestnuts. You have to dry them or freeze them or something. Uh, there's a bunch of preservation methods out there. I'm not going to tell you about that. It's not my expertise. Uh, black walnuts, they are easy to grow. They are cultivated varieties. They grow all over uh, a wide range. Uh, the flavor is, uh, some people like them better than others. What I do with black walnuts, I collected all of the wild ones. I don't have not bothered to plant them because we have so many wild ones. Although I've been, uh, the wild ones actually crack out more easily, the, the, or the cultivated ones crack out more easily. The wild ones can be pretty hard to crack and they come out in little tiny pieces. In English, in any case, uh, mixing the black walnuts I have found with other nuts really, like if you got a bowl of pecans and a bowl of black walnuts after you crack them out, mix them up, and they all taste like pecans. It's kind of like doubling your pecan supply. Uh, English walnuts, they are not great in Virginia. Here's another place where the USDA zone system fails. Uh, the nurseries will tell you they grow here. They don't really. Uh, they have issues with, with spring frost, with humidity. I'm not even sure why. They, they're not great in this area. Uh, heart nut, now those do grow well in Virginia in terms of uh, winter cold. They're fine. Uh, their weakness, the same with heart nut, which is uh, all three of those nuts, heart nut, bark nut, and butternut. So uh, heart nut and butternut are two, uh, heart nut's an Asian walnut, butternut, well, I don't know where it's from. I, I know it's all over uh, North America, the uh, colder parts of North America. Uh, Bart nut is actually a cross between the two. So the Asian walnuts, again, going back to that climate oscillation that happens in the US and doesn't happen in Asia as much, uh, they can get really zapped by spring frost. And that's been an increasingly difficult issue with the destabilization of the jet stream and the, the polar vortex we've been facing since about 2011. So I started planting some back around 2010, 2011. I backed off from them at this point. If you're in, a, in an area that uh, has more climate stability or if you have different experience, uh, I'd be interested to hear it. Uh, the ones I've seen around here have been getting burned, beat up the last few years. Okay, persimmon family. Um, among the soft fruits, uh, persimmons are my favorite by far. They are uh, far away, the, the, uh, they have an excellent flavor. Uh, they're, they're incredibly sweet, tasty fruit. Uh, you can eat them through much of the winter. Uh, and uh, they're very, very trouble-free trees. Uh, no spray, no bugs. There are some diseases that impact the trees, but they're usually not devastating. There's a few borers and things that can get into them, but uh, it's usually not, not bad. Now, there are three, a few primary branches of the persimmon family, I call it a family. I'm not gonna throw a ton of Latin at you, but uh, Asian uh, is, are the khaki persimmons. Those have historically been a major food source uh, in Asia, China, Japan, uh, Korea, that whole area uh, for uh, millennia. Uh, and there's been hundreds of varieties that have been bred. bred. Um, uh, our favorite Asian persimmons. It's interesting, right where we are, right where I'm sitting, I can't grow the Asian persimmons because we're in a little cold pocket, but 30, 40 miles to the west or 40 miles to the east, the Asian persimmons do fine. 
with that close to the edge. Uh, so I actually grow a bunch of Asian persimmons, but not at Living Energy Farm. Uh, my favorites are side, my absolute favorite is the saigo. That is a fantastic tree. It's a big, vigorous tree. The fruit has an immaculately consistent uh, flavor texture. Uh, Tecumseh is one bred by Jim Shanks. Uh, uh, the thing I like about Tecumseh is it lasts through the winter. Now you can pick Tecumsehs all the way through the whole winter if the varmints are getting to them. Uh, and uh, if they do start to get to them, you just bring them inside. Uh, Miss Kim is a really sweet one. Hachaya is a common commercial ver uh, variety. That's also a really sweet one. Now with the disruption of the polar vortex, the, the khakis, people used to grow them in zone six, push them up into Pennsylvania. I don't think that's working anymore. I know at Living Energy Farm, I had 65 varieties of khaki persimmons and I've lost pretty much all of them because of the polar vortex since 2011. Uh, so I'm not doing khakis anymore at Living Energy Farm. We do them in Richmond and Charlottesville. For those of you who know Virginia, that's really close to where we are. But in any case, uh, so they're fine in zone seven, but not zone six. Um, uh, so uh, my very favorite fruit in the whole wide world uh, are the uh, Asian American cross persimmons. So the khaki persimmons have that incredible sweet flavor. The American persimmons, which in the Latin, that's Virginiana, are a denser, heavier fruit, but they're often pretty seedy. Some of the wild ones are really good. Some of them aren't as good. Uh, but it was the Rosianca was the first cross. It was actually a staunch Stalinist back in the 50s or 60s back there somewhere that achieved the first khaki Virginiana cross, and that was the Rosianca. So if you're an American woman and you go to Russia, I am told, I don't speak Russian, you'd be called an Amerianka. Uh, so Rosianka is like Russian woman. I think he was trying to, uh, it was like a term of endearment, like my beautiful uh, fruit that he created. Anyway, it's an amazing tree. It will uh, produce fruit that starts getting ripe in November. It has that wonderful sweet flavor of the Asian persimmons. And like the Tecumseh, it hangs on the tree through the whole winter. Uh, or if you bring it inside, you can still eat it. Last year, we picked hundreds of pounds of these things and I kept them out in our tool shed. Uh, we ate them through, through the end of January until we ran out, but just sitting out in the cold, uh, they're varmint free, pest free. Uh, it takes, they are a little slower pr to produce than some other trees. It takes them maybe six years to get going. But a tree the size of, of your arm, the trunk, with a trunk the size of your arm will produce 200 pounds of fruit. Tremendously productive trees. Uh, Nikita's gift was bred from the Rosianca. It is a smaller tree. It does come into fruiting much more quickly. The Nikita will come in in two or three years. Uh, it is earlier, so it ripens in October, November. Um, but it also has a wonderful uh, flavor, nice, uh, like the, that sweet of the Asian persimmons, but a little uh, thicker, uh, just fantastic flavor. It makes my mouth water just sitting here looking at these pictures, I'll tell you. These are wonderful trees. Now, uh, just in recent years, there's been some more Asian American crosses created. There's been four that have been created and three that are reputed to be good for the zone six, zone seven kind of areas. Makusu, Cassandra, and Zima Kerma are those three. Uh, I have those trees, but we just got them, so I can't tell you uh, if uh, what they're like. I've, I've never eaten them, just got the trees recently. Uh, Ask me in a few years. Uh, the American persimmons are also great fruit uh, food producers, and they will go quite a bit uh, zone four or five. I don't know where they stop. They go quite a bit further north than where we are. Uh, the proc is the sweetest. That's a fantastic fruit. Uh, it gets early, right, really early, late August, September in Virginia. Uh, the ruby I like, it's a bit later. Uh, so the, I'm a little disappointed, honestly, that they, all of the American cultivar persimmons, and there's a bunch of them, there's Yates and Meter and a bunch of them, they've all been bred from early uh, ripening persimmons, which for us on a farm, you know, there's fruit that rots on the ground in August and September because we're buried. We don't have the time to, to pick it. So that's part of the reason I like the Tecumseh and the Rosianca, some of these others that get right through the dead of winter. Um, Blight resistant pears, uh, they are a fantastic crop. Now among the common fruits, meaning apples, peaches, plums, cherries, the stuff people have heard of, pears will generally produce fruit with little or no management. Uh, you will get some bugginess in them sometimes. They will produce more fruit if you prune them a little bit, but even if you just plant them and ignore them, you will get most of the time good fruit. Uh, the suckle is a fantastic pear. The ears we have, we really love it. Potomac is great. Uh, Shenandoah is great. Uh, Harrow Delight, I have, uh, actually Harrow Sweet. We haven't picked a Harrow Delight yet. We have a Harrow Delight and Harrow Sweet. Was uh, very pleased to realize in the last couple of years that the Harrow Sweet is a very late ripening pair. Again, I like late ripening stuff. Um, 
So uh, if you want to plant common fruit, pears are, are the best. Uh, and they are also, you can do anything with a pear that you can do with an apple. If you like applesauce, if you like cider, if you want to make whatever, uh, just substitute pears for apples. Uh, Jen, we do still grow some apples, although I have, you know, I have a handful of apple trees and a whole lot of other trees. But what we do is we mix the pears and the apples um, when it comes time to make sauce, and we dry some of the pears. So a pear applesauce is, is a fine uh, fine sauce. Kids love it. Uh, pear cider is to die for. Oh, my God. So good. Um, okay, kiwi family. Now, I say family because people are familiar with those fuzzy kiwis you buy in the grocery store. Uh, Latin name is Actinidia, but there are at least a half a dozen different vines in that family that will produce fruit. Uh, the fuzzy kiwi is the southernmost of those vines. But even though, uh, and through a lot of experimentation in Virginia, we have realized that if you plant in a, in a somewhat protected location, you can get the fuzzy kiwis up into zone six, uh, maybe 6B, not 6A, I don't think. But in any case, they're pretty tough. They've held up better than some of the other uh, uh, plants that we've had since 2011 with the, the cold polar vortex disturbance that we've been having. Uh, the amazing thing about fuzzy kiwis is, again, like the Rosianca, some of these other fruits, you can pick them uh, in November. You put them in a root cellar and cool location. You can eat them all winter. Uh, you'll lose a quarter or a third of them that'll rot before you find them. But if you just kind of sneak through there every once in a while and grab the soft ones, you can have fresh kiwis right through December, January, February, March, out into April even. So, and you grow them yourself and there's no canning, no freezing. All you do is pick them, put them in a tray or a basket, put them on a shelf uh, in a root cellar or somewhere, or if you got a cool room in your house, eat them all winter. Now the fuzzy kiwis are also gaining in popularity. Uh, all kiwis, everything in that family, to my knowledge, has to have a male and a female. The female needs a male and the, uh, and the male does not produce fruit. So if, if you're gonna plant two vines, you gotta have a male and a female. The one exception to that is a kiwi called the Asai, I-E-S-S-A-I. And if you're gonna plant hardy kiwis, I strongly recommend the Asai. And here's why. Uh, hardy kiwis in particular can be a little fussy uh, there are uh, intensive management techniques. If you look at uh, my pamphlet, you'll get a little bit of that. Uh, edible landscaping is, uh, I'll talk about them in a little bit. They're friends of mine. They run a nursery near here. The care guides at Edible Landscaping will give you some instructions about how to take care of your plants, including kiwis. The guy who has uh, trademarked the term kiwi berry, so if you go, I think it's kiwiberry.com, he has some of his management technique uh, online that you can look at. Now, if you don't want to manage, Hardy kiwis, they're like the kiwi the size of a seedless grape. You pop the whole thing in your mouth. It's sweeter than an ordinary kiwi. They're fantastic. The wonderful thing about the acai is it doesn't need a male. It's self-fertile, and it is self-managing. You don't have to prune it. You don't have to fuss with it. You just plant it. It'll make fruit every year. They can be a little bit frost-sensitive, not too bad, and they don't like crappy soil. You want good dirt, fertile soil, not too wet, not too dry. If you're living on beach sand in the coastal plain or on a mountaintop, uh, maybe not so good, but good fertile soil and they are fantastically productive, disease-free, insect-free. The pests don't bother them too much, maybe a little bit. Um, pomegranates, wonderful fruit. Uh, this guy, Gregory Levin, uh, collected 1,117 pomegranates. He worked under the Soviet Union uh, when it was the Soviet Union in Turkmenistan. He put together a station. When the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, he moved to Israel. He was Jewish and shipped a bunch of those cuttings from his trees all over the world, <clears throat> uh, particular to the USDA uh, germoplasm repository in uh, California, uh, Davis, California. Uh, since then, people have been experimenting a bunch with his different pomegranates to try to figure out which ones will grow in cooler areas. Up until 2011, we were doing great with the Solovatsky, which also gets, uh, sometimes gets called Russian. Uh, since then, they got frozen back in those uh, cold years that we've been having. There's been a lot of experimentation going on. I've got 25 varieties at this point, and the ones that made it through this past winter, which was a pretty bitter cold winter in zone seven, uh, was the Salavatsky, Crimson Sky, Kayasi Kanor, one called R35, I don't know where that's from, and Esperonsky, Krasnai. Uh, I don't even know what languages I'm speaking here, but in any case. Um, and some of these, might you might be able to sneak them into zone six, maybe. Uh, so that's an ongoing experimentation. What you're looking at there is a picture of the Salavatsky. Uh, they are a fantastic fruit. Not only do, are they trouble-free as long as they're warm enough, the, the varmints don't touch them. Squirrels, birds, deer, nobody touches them. They, when you first start to see them start to crack open, you pick them, bring them inside, uh, you, you never have to do anything with them. They will tolerate drought. They don't mind really bad dry conditions. 
they do not like uh, mud. So, you know, uh, yeah, just don't, don't plant them in a muddy spot. Um, jujubes, again, little known in the U.S., uh, quite popular in Asia. And historically, they eat them as, as uh, fresh fruit, dried fruit, or make candy out of them. They are very easy to dry. They're kind of naturally a dry fruit. They're like a little apple, like a little crunchy apple in there. Uh, they, they grow when they're green, and when they start to get ripe, you can see the picture here, they start to turn brown. Uh, we can just throw them in our dryer here. Now, we've got a really big dryer that we run off of our solar heating system. Um, but they dry super easy. You don't have to cut them open or anything. You just throw them in the dryer, uh, and they dry right up. Uh, and then you can uh, put them in a mason jar and eat them all winter. But the one weakness of jujubes uh, uh, is that the fruit itself, when you get to ripening time, which is, you know, September, if you start getting heavy rains, like day after day after day of rain, the fruit will simply rot on the tree. Uh, so if you notice your jujubes are starting to turn a little bit brown and you look at the weather forecast and, oh, my goodness, here's a big storm front coming and it's going to rain for a week, just go out there and pick them. Uh, you know, right when they first start to turn brown, go out there, go out there and pick them and uh, eat them, dry them, do something with them. Uh, you can candy them. That's what they do in Asia. Another thing to know about jujubes, uh, they send up uh, suckers. Uh, from around the base of the tree and in the root zone, they do that too. Uh, it's just part of the price of growing jujubes. You have to keep cutting those back. It's not hard. It doesn't take a lot of time. Just once a year, if you go uh, whack off the crap that's growing around the tree, they're fine. Uh, I really like them. Uh, pawpaws. Uh, now, I don't know, of course, with this webinar, we have people all over the world. Uh, the term pawpaw, if you go on the internet and look at pawpaw, um, mostly that word is used internationally outside of the United States to refer to what Americans call papayas. Uh, in the United States, pawpaw refers to a Native American fruit, Asimina triloba, which you see in the picture there. They grow throughout the southeastern and midwestern U.S. Uh, they've been gaining quite a bit more popularity. People are fascinated with them. You can see the ones in that picture. They get to be pretty good size, uh, about as big as a mango in, in, in uh, some cases. Uh, they have a unique uh, custardy, soft texture. Uh, when they're fully ripe, uh, they can be really sweet and lovely. Uh, in my experience, they have a limited applicability as a self-sufficiency fruit. It really comes down to whether or not you have a freezer because they have a, a few weaknesses that limit their, their food value. Uh, number one is that a lot of people have some digestive upset with them. Sometimes it's significant, sometimes not. Um, so you just try one, see how you feel before you go plant a bunch of trees. I've known some people can eat 30 of them a day and they're fine. I can eat one or two a day. That's about as much as I can handle. The digestibility of these fruit is, is much better if they're fully ripe but not overripe. So don't try to eat them green and don't eat them when they, they start to turn all brown. And if you can get your hands on them and tug on them and if they start to soften off a little bit on the tree, they come off into your hand, bring them inside, let them get soft, but, uh, and, but go ahead and eat them before they get brown. That, that's where they're uh, best digested. The problem is they're a non-acidic fruit, so you can't uh, can them. Uh, and also, if you dry them, it doesn't work either. They, they, they mess with your stomach much worse then. So it really comes down to freezer space. If you like pawpaws, if you have a chest freezer, you can grow a bunch of them and keep them. If you don't have a chest freezer, uh, you can only eat uh, what gets ripe when they get ripe. And they go from green to ripe to rotten in a few days. So they have lost ground in my self-sufficiency uh, uh, estimation. But they are trouble-free. There's, there's a caterpillar that can eat the leaves. Uh, some people think the plant and the fruit may have some additional qualities. I'm not going to speak to that. There's been some anti-cancer research on these plants. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, yeah, they, the, the, uh, the raccoons and possums will start to eat them once they get fully ripe. But other than that, the, the, they're, they're trouble-free. They don't have any trouble. They are not strong pollinators. So, you know, like with pear trees, if there's two pear trees within a quarter mile of each other, the bees will find their way back and forth. With pawpaws, you want two of them, put them right up next against each other, 10, 12, 15 feet apart, so they can pollinate each other. They're pollinated by flies, not by uh, uh, bees. They're kind of a strange plant, really, but fruit's pretty good, uh, just not, not a bulk producer in my estimation. Uh, figs are a fantastic crop. If it's hot enough, uh, of course, if you're in zone 8 or warmer, do what you want. Uh, in zone 7 or cooler, you know, people grow these things up in Canada. Uh, the nice thing about figs is they recover fairly quickly. So even the thing with a pomegranate, for instance, if it freezes to the ground, you're looking at another four or five years before that thing gets back up big enough to make a good crop of fruit. With figs, you can knock them to the ground, and if you have a warm fall, you'll get fruit the following fall. Uh, if you are in zone seven or six or, or cooler areas want to grow figs, the trick is, if you're willing to do it, if you've got a bunch of mulch, 
um, uh, pile a bunch of mulch around the base of the tree. You can even bend down the whole tree and bury it uh, if, if you've got enough patience for that. It's not going to help much to wrap a bunch of plastic or cloth around the branches. I mean, it'll help a little bit, but it's really better to just bed it up really heavy with, you know, wood chips, uh, whatever you got, uh, straw, leaves, something. Uh, that way you'll at least preserve the base of the tree and it will come back and make some good figs. Uh, the Chicago Hardy has gained a name as being a more cold hardy fig. It freezes back the same as many other figs. The difference is it starts growing earlier. It grows at lower temperatures. It ripens a much uh, bigger volume of fruit in some of cool temperatures and it keeps growing later into the fall. Now I have acquired a couple dozen varieties of figs and as far as I can tell the Chicago Hardy Genoso and Sal's it's either the same plant or so closely related you can't tell the difference. Uh, figs are super easy to propagate. So if you're in zone six, seven cooler areas, uh, just tuck it up against the wall of your house, the warmest spot you can find. Uh, they are tolerant of a wide variety of soils, but you really want that warmth. That's the real trick with growing figs. Grapes and muscadines. Uh, so, oh boy, they, again, in my mouth just waters looking at these pictures. I grew up down in Georgia. And, uh, in the south, southern United States, a grape is a muscadine, a muscadine is a grape, there's no difference. Uh, I will have to warn you. Now, those of you who live all over the world, if you're in a dry place on a mountaintop, uh, you, can, you can grow all kinds of different grapes. If you're in a humid area, do not believe the catalogs when they send you these pictures of, of Cebus grapes, table grapes, wine grapes, champagne grapes, and say this is going to grow in zone 7, 8, you know, wherever humidity, don't worry about it. That's true if you're willing to spray the bejesus out of it. You're willing to dump a bunch of fungicides on your grapes, you can grow all kind of stuff. If you are in zone seven or south, if you are in a humid area, muscadines are hands down the best thing you can grow as far as a grape grows, uh, goes. They are super sweet. Uh, they are indestructible plants. They are impervious to drought. Uh, I've seen, we've had some bad droughts in Virginia over the years. I remember one year I lost a five-year-old apple tree to a drought. And you know, after a few years, the tree is usually impervious to drought. Most fruit trees are just pretty tough. The kiwis are an exception. They, they want water. Even a mature kiwi wants a little bit of water if you get into a severe drought. The muscadines, they don't even drop their fruit. If you have a really severe drought, the fruit will be a little bit smaller. They hardly even notice. Uh, so they do have a tough skin on the outside of them. You usually spit the skin out, spit the seeds out. But they're very, very sweet and very, very tough plants. Uh, the one European grape that does really well, even in humid areas, is the uh, uh, Concord grape. It's okay for fresh eating, really makes good juice. It's an excellent juice grape. Uh, so if you grow on a mountain, if you live on a mountaintop, if you live in California, if you live in a dry area, then you can tell me what you grow there. But I know in the Southeast, uh, you have to kind of leave aside the seedless grapes, uh, table grapes, wine grapes, uh, and grow for the muscadines. There's also a muscadine cross now. They cross the muscadine with the European grape, got something called a Southern home. Uh, and that has so far been holding up fine in zone six. I don't know if it'll go any further north than that. And it's a beautiful plant too. It's got wonderful leaves, uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, looking leaves. Uh, so that hopefully is the plant that's going to allow the muscadines to go a bit further north. Uh, Eleagnus family, again, another family of plants. Uh, uh, autumn olives are well known. They're highly invasive. I don't recommend people planting those necessarily. The, uh, the um, uh, gumi is our favorite. Uh, that gets ripe in June in our area, which is pretty early. It's not invasive as far as I know. Uh, they're pretty tart. All the berries in that family are pretty tart. Uh, but if you let them get fully ripe, so they turn red, and you let them sit on the bush another 10 days or two weeks until they start to drop off the bush a little bit, and then the tartness backs off a little bit, and you've got something about like lemonade. Uh, I really like them. And they're not great. You're not going to make jam and stuff out of them particularly. I mean, you can. I have made autumn olive jam before. The gummies actually don't go through a juicer very well. Uh, the sea berry or sea buckthorn uh, that uh, some of the permies, permaculturalists are enthusiastic about is an Eleagnus. The one nice thing about the Eleagnus family is it's a nitrogen fixing family, which means they're growing awful, awful soil. Um, so uh, medlar, uh, these are relatives of pears historically grown in Europe. Uh, we've grown some good medlars. Uh, past couple of years, ours have really had disease issues again cedar apple rusts and blight, things like that, because of uh, the warm, humid springs. Uh, they are another winter fruit. They're not heavy producers, uh, but because you can eat them in the dead of winter, you pick these things in October, November, you bring them inside and you're eating them in the cold, cold weather, uh, that gives them some value. Uh, just, you know, because you want to eat cabbage and potatoes all winter, right? Um, so uh, is, uh, we'll talk about the traditional fruits, fruits that uh, need more support. 
if you are going to, going to grow apples, uh, a couple things you might want to do. Uh, check out Edible Landscaping. They're a fantastic nursery uh, that gives you, they only sell disease resistant plants. They really try to stick to that as best they can. Cummins Nursery is another good nursery. They have a chart, at least I hope it's still there on their website, that gives you uh, the relative resistance of a bunch of different apple varieties. Uh, beware that the heirloom apples are not the best in terms of disease resistance. Some of the modern ones are actually better. You really, if you're going to plant apples, Try to find the disease resistant ones and beware that disease resistance does not imply insect resistance. Uh, peaches, I'll tell you, we used to have a lot of peach trees uh, and I've cut most of them down this point and converted them to almond trees, just whack them off and graft almonds onto them, that hauls hardy. Uh, but uh, we've actually done better with seed grown almonds, uh, seed grown peaches, I mean. Uh, a lot of the commercial peaches have, are really vulnerable to uh, the brown rod in particular. They, they turn, they, you have these red fruit, people want to buy fruit based on appearance. Uh, but the ones we've grown from seeds are better. Now, so if you go to the grocery store, you get a handful of peaches you like, uh, save a dozen seeds, only one or two of them will actually sprout, put them in the yard where you want a tree and grow them out that way. And they will attract a whole bunch of bugs, but we get a lot of peaches even off of one or two trees these days. We don't have a lot of trees. Uh, cherries, again, if you're in a dry area, if you're on a mountaintop, you can do sweet cherries. Some people do some sweet cherries in the southeast. They're much more difficult. Sour cherries are easier. The best of the sour cherries is, I think, the North Star. It's a bigger cherry, has decent flavor if you let it get fully ripe. Um, we've tried a bunch of other sour cherries, and so far I haven't found anything that's as good as the North Star. Uh, so that's what I recommend to people. It's a genetic dwarf, so it doesn't turn into a huge tree. Uh, it seems to do mostly okay. Uh, it, you know, it's, it doesn't taste as good as a sweet cherry, honestly. But, uh, you know, if, if you don't mind experimenting, you can mess around with sweet cherries. But I wouldn't hold your breath and don't count on it feeding you. Um, plums, uh, there are a number of wild plums that grow in the southeast, and even the wild plums only seem to produce every maybe one in three or four or five years, you get a decent crop. Uh, the Japanese plums in particular are not going to do great in hot, humid areas necessarily. You can find neighbors who have plums uh, that are making plums, and yeah, okay, get those, graft them if you want to. 98% uh, of the plum trees I've seen planted in Virginia make little or no fruit. Uh, just have to say that. Um, Berries, berries, berries. If you're trying to build a quick orchard, uh, by far the best way to do it is with, straw, with berries. Uh, there are a bunch of different kinds of berries. We'll just mention a few. Uh, strawberries, super easy to grow. They do take more work. You got to keep, uh, keep the, you know, keep them, take care of them year round. I have been told, and what we have learned works pretty well. If you're really lazy, uh, you can get strawberry plants in the fall, either from your friends or wherever. Plant them in the fall. You'll produce a, a moderate spring crop, and then just plow them in if you don't want to take care of them all summer. Uh, or you can let them weed up over the summer and pull out some plants in the fall, whatever you want to do, or you can take care of them all summer. In any case, um, you know, strawberries are easy and they're great for small areas. A lot of areas are a little bit shade tolerant, great for, you know, city lots, uh, you know, uh, uh, rooftop gardens, whatever, uh, and also really fast. I mean, you plant strawberries in the fall, get them in the spring, plant, plant raspberries one year, get them the next year, black, uh, blackberries, plant them, get, uh, pick fruit the next year. Um, blueberries are a, a popular fruit. And there are many, many, many different kinds of plants uh, called blueberries. There's the northern blueberries, southern blueberries, a whole bunch of different variations, uh, hundreds and hundreds of varieties now. Uh, the big mistake people make in planting blueberries is they're, they're really unlike any other plant. But any, any other tree, you stick it in the ground, the roots go through the ground, look for nutrients, that's how the tree grows. Blueberries don't do that. They root across the top of the soil, and their plants uh, 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 it's this complex relationship they have, but they think of it as just eating organic matter. So what you need to do is don't dig a hole in the clay, for God's sake, that won't work. But right on the top of the ground, get a bunch of wood chips. If you've got like three-year-old wood chips, that's ideal. If you don't have that, get some peat moss, a little bit of compost, like two-thirds uh, peat moss, one-third compost, aged wood chips. I do, you know, uh, half wood chips, half topsoil. Get the top six few inches of the soil mixed in with a lot of organic matter. And then put your blueberries in that. And then every year, sweep some more leaves, wood chips, straw up around those blueberry plants. And those roots, uh, they're surface rooted and they, they consume uh, organic, organic matter. If the leaves start to bleach out, you get real pale leaves on your blueberry plants. That means the soil is not acidic enough. You don't have enough organic matter. You can use sulfur, but use elemental sulfur, not aluminum sulfate. Uh, if you're in New England or the upper Midwest, you plant northern varieties of blueberries. In the south, you plant rabbit eyes. Uh, we have had, uh, there are now some uh, north-south crosses called southern highbush. We've had some pretty good luck with those, like the O'Neill is one good one. Um, 
and you get some of the flavor of the northern ones, which is frankly a little better. The rabbit eyes are indestructible plants. They're kind of tart though later in the year. Uh, raspberries, pretty trouble free. Uh, we grow a lot of those. They do like good soil. Uh, the only uh, big issue we've had with raspberries is the deer love them. So if you have deer around, you'll need to put them right up next to your house. Heritage is a really common variety. We've done really well with that variety. Um, currants, uh, we are at the southern limit of where currants grow here in Virginia. They do fine, though. I know a number of people growing red currants. I'm not sure about black currants. I've seen those further west. Uh, the red currants, they're pretty tart. You need them off the bush if you want. Kind of slow to pick. Uh, most berries are slow to pick. So if you're thinking about something for making jam uh, or preserves, uh, either stick with the other fruits I mentioned earlier or go to blackberries. Uh, blackberries are by far the fastest to pick. But people do like their currants. And some people I know make gooseberry jam, but you're going to make, you know, a few pints. Uh, whereas with, uh, you know, in, in 30 minutes, I can pick 200 pounds of peaches or, you know, a pint of blueberries or a pint of currants. Real big difference in how the volume of picking time with some of these fruits. Anyway, uh, gooseberries, super easy to grow, slow to pick, uh, southern end of their range as well. Uh, Juneberry, serviceberry, sarvisberry, saskatoon, and that's a little berry that has many names. We're at the southern end of that berry. That berry has a lot of issues with, uh, can have a lot of issues with cedar apple rust in this area. We get a good crop every other year, maybe. Uh, wonderful flavor, I love them, uh, but not super reliable in this climate. Again, drier, colder areas, they're going to do better. Uh, blackberries, we've had great uh, luck with one called the Triple Crown. Much faster to pick than other berries. Uh, wonderful plant. Deer don't, don't go after them quite as much. Uh, good cold resistance. Uh, you can either run them on a trellis or uh, trim them so that they stay kind of bushy, at which point they'll hold themselves up. Uh, we are trying a bunch of other blackberries, but so far the Triple Crown is the best we find. found. Uh, passion fruit, we grow some of those. Uh, not a self-sufficiency food at all. They, they don't fill your belly, but they're beautiful plants. They make a, a beautiful uh, flower. The, the bumblebees go crazy over them. Uh, they do vine. They, get, they go underground and sprout up, so don't put them like next to your herb garden. They'll get in your herb garden and be kind of annoying. Uh, kind of keep them a little bit separate from other stuff, but they're really pretty and they're tasty. Mulberries, we love the Illinois Everbearing. Uh, fantastic tree. Uh, Giraldi Dwarf is also another good tree. If you start getting uh, popcorn disease, that's where you look like you've got unpopped popcorn kernels, popcorn kernels on your Illinois Everbearing. Make sure and capture that fruit and get it into a jar and get that jar away from the tree at the end of the season. The disease propagates through the fruit itself, not through the wood of the tree. Don't start whacking on your tree. That's the one disease that affects that tree. But mulberries will outproduce any of these other fruits, but not quite as fast to pick as, say, blackberries but tremendously productive trees. And that Illinois Everbearing will turn into a monster tree if you, if you let it. Uh, the Gerald is nice, it doesn't get quite so big. Also has a good flavor. A bunch of mulberries out there that don't have quite as good a flavor and some mulberries that can't go beyond zone seven. Uh, so, but the Illinois is plenty tough in our area. Uh, this is the list of nurseries that I have found to be good to work with. Edible landscaping in particular, Michael McConkie runs that nursery. He and I have got to be good friends. He and I did an orchard planting workshop a couple of years ago, we had it filmed. Now it was done in my living room, so we're not talking Hollywood here, but in any case, we filmed it. That can be purchased on their website. I think it's $25. It's a six hours of video, maybe. It's, it's a long video. Um, uh, so and Michael knows things that I don't know, but we, we talked together about the whole thing. I'm a little more cynical than he is, but in any case, he is really the only nursery I know of in the United States that's tried to set himself up as an educational facility. He does a lot of public workshops there try to educate people about how to grow disease-resistant fruit, uh, which means uh, pawpaws, persimmons, jujubes, muscadines, uh, those things that you don't have to spray. Uh, great, great nursery. I highly recommend him. He also sells good quality stuff. You're not going to get crummy trees from him. Um, uh, Hidden Springs, small family nursery. Uh, they're great. Cummins Nursery, they're a New England nursery. Uh, again, they can help you educate you some on some of the disease-resistant stuff. If you're looking to do a commercial blueberry farm, Finch is where you would go to, cheap blueberry plants uh, by the Bazillion, uh, Nolan River, I've used them for, for uh, some uh, various fruits. But the one down at the bottom, Grimo, if you're gonna do, uh, if you're gonna do filberts, uh, they are by far the best filbert trees. They've got excellent filbert trees. If you wanna do cold hardy citrus, I didn't talk much about citrus, but if you're in zone seven, zone eight, and you wanna mess around with cold hardy citrus, talk to Stan McKenzie. Um, so there's a few nurseries. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up for uh, the presentation, and then uh, we've got we're coming up on our hour here. If we've got any questions, we can uh, uh, 
answer questions. All right. So everybody, uh, type in your questions. A couple of announcements before I go to the questions. Uh, you can get the PDF uh, handouts. Um, go right under the handout section and click on the PDF. One from last week and one of this week. And this was uh, this was a specially delicious one uh, that we saw today. So you can <laughs> so you want to have these um, all the resources. Uh, and everything you can download that and um, after this we're going to show you webinar highlights of the week and you're going to see bits and pieces from all the webinars we did not all but most of the webinars we did this week so you'll see little clips and you can go back and watch the whole uh, full-length webinars um, of all the previous sessions we did on eatcommunity.com and that's the website. So right now, people, um, let me see what questions you have. So here is one. Uh, so for a small farm with low production, uh, one should consider biodiversity of crops to maximize to minimize the use of chemicals. In short, we should minimize monoculture. Any thoughts on that? Uh, that is true to a limited degree, um, but, you know, when it comes to plum curculios or even deer, you know, biodiversity doesn't do a bit of good for you. I mean, if you're talking about controlling corn blight, you know, the fact that the United States has a very narrow genetic basis of its, you know, staple crops, that's an issue. But if you have one tree in your yard and the varmints want to eat it, they're going to come find it and they're going to eat it. Uh, so... You know, the, the biodiversity, I mean, it's useful in kind of the bigger picture. It doesn't really do you that much good in the smaller picture. And in fact, the opposite is actually more true in the sense that in my experience managing orchards, for instance, with us, we pack our most, our peach trees, for instance, are right up around the duck coop. Or if you got chickens, put the chickens around your peach trees. You'd actually want to cluster your peach trees together because the peach trees, if you're going to grow peaches, you don't have to. Uh, but if you are going to grow peaches, if you want to put them all together, so so you can manage them together. And one of the best management practices in terms of, of a low maintenance practice, I wouldn't get chickens or ducks just for the sake of the bugs, but if you happen to have chickens and you happen to have ducks and you happen to want peaches, put them all together and they're great. So, so it is true that biodiversity is good. It is not true that biodiversity on a small farm will make the insects and the varmints go away. It just doesn't work that way. You're really better off, like if you can keep all your nut trees together, I don't know if you're willing to use a gun or shoot the squirrels, but if you got them scattered all over your farm, you're not going to pick any nuts. If you got them all together, you can do a better job of defending them. In fact, there's a, a video, uh, an audio tape called uh, Crow Be Gone that works pretty well. Like if you've got two pecan trees and they happen to be right next to each other, you can put an audio player out there and it, it plays these crow distress crawls and scares the crows away. Again, you're going to be really better off bunching your stuff together. So I think on a small farm, you, you don't want to scatter stuff all over the place. You want to keep it more clustered up. But when we're talking about big picture, you know, the, the diversity of our food crops. Yeah, we want as much diversity as possible, but on a management level, you want to really think about how you're going to take care of your trees. Right. So here are a bunch of questions. Um, one from Alicia Rose. In the colder climates, any thoughts about grow, growing fig uh, in high hill greenhouse, greenhouses? Uh, a green, it depends now, uh, a high tunnel. Generally, a high tunnel is going to give you maybe 10 degrees if you're lucky. Uh, so if you were in a cold climate and you put them in a high tunnel and then you buried them down with mulch, you and it depends on how cold, of course, there's quite a bit of variability. Uh, so, you know, and also high tunnels, they can be single wall, double wall, you know, a more elaborate greenhouse. It's like a more old fashioned kind of rigid structured greenhouse or, you know, I've seen people put a wood stove in a greenhouse. So there's a lot of different kind of greenhouses, but a high tunnel by itself uh, is going to give you, you know, five or 10 degrees. But, you know, it's not like you're going to take a high tunnel up into, to, uh, you know, Canada and grow figs without mulching them down. Uh, so, yeah, it helps some, but it's not a silver bullet. And the mulch is actually, I mean, what a lot of people do, and this goes back to growing vegetables, is they put stuff in the high tunnel. And then they'll put like floating row cover over that, which gives you another layer of protection. 
So again, if you put your figs in a high tunnel and then mulch them down, yeah, you could probably do you'd probably do pretty well with that. Okay. Any beneficial values of kudzu? Kudzu, uh, it is edible, uh, and it is edible for both humans and cattle. So the best way to control kudzu is to put cattle on it, sheep or goats, sheep or cows. This is what I'm told. I've never done it. Uh, the roots and the plants, I think. Uh, well, pretty sure you should research that. Don't go poison yourself. But uh, every, I've always been told that the plant's edible. But other than that, don't plant it on purpose. It is very aggressive. I mean, there are entire right. mountains in, in Georgia in particular that are covered in nothing but kudzu. Uh, okay. So. Yeah. All right. So here is another question. Um, any thoughts about growing crab apples for food? Um, sure. Uh, crab apples uh, are historically, some of the nurseries sell crab apples. Uh, they can make fantastic jam. Crab apples, crab apples, of course, are related to apples and quince are related to pears. And crab apples and quince both are kind of tart, small versions of the bigger fruit. And they both make fantastic jam. Uh, what you're going to run into is the same set of disease issues that you have with apples. Um, so again, if you're on a mountaintop, if you've got really good air drainage, um, you're going to do better with them. Uh, you might look for disease resistant varieties. I'm not an expert on crab apples. I know some of the nurseries carry them. I know I've seen some crab apple trees and there's some variability. Some of them are bred for uh, flowers. Some of them are bred for the fruit. If you can find a crab apple that does well in your climate uh, and has somewhat larger fruit, I've seen some that'll have like golf ball sized fruit that make fantastic jam, just the best jam you've ever tasted. Um, but, you know, again, in the hot, humid areas, you'll just have to figure out what grows. Um, so, yeah, that's the best I can say. Okay. Her next question is about Quincy. So, any thoughts about growing Quincy? Quince, I think you're saying. Quince, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't pronounce right. They, uh, we have some Quince planted. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I know Michael at Edible Landscaping doesn't sell them because they can have a lot of disease issues as well. Uh, my family down in Georgia grows quince historically. It's a flowering quince that's been in my family since forever, and it makes the most divine jam you've ever eaten. Uh, the sweeter quinces that have been bred that, are, that aren't so tart, a normal quince is like super sour. Uh, some of the sweeter quinces I have read, I have been told, uh, do not do well because of, of diseases. Um, but again, I think it would come down to finding one that can stand up in your climate. Are you in a humid area, a dry area? Uh, uh, I know I've, I've seen a number of people grow them uh, with good results. Uh, I, I think, you know, again, the same set of diseases that hits, hits some of these fruits are going to give you trouble. Uh, so look for disease resistant unless you're in a, an area with really, with really uh, dry conditions. Uh, the jam, though, you can take that super sour fruit you cook the bejesus out of it, you throw in a bunch of sugar, it, it really is divine jam. My, my sister makes a bunch of it every year. It's fantastic. All right. So here's a question from Robert Hayes. Um, he says, our apple blossoms all um, get eaten by squirrels um, who just stuff themselves. Are, um, are any zone seven um, Persimmon trees, right? Is that P E R S I double M O N? Yeah, persimmon. Okay. Are there any trees that are resistant to squirrels? Thanks. Uh, well, attractive to squirrels is the issue. Uh, now, like I said, if you get, if you make it so that the squirrels have to run on the ground, and you have a dog, you're done with the squirrels. They'll leave you alone. Whether or not you want to kill squirrels, I'll leave that up to you. You can't scare them away. You either have to kill them. You can scare them away with a dog, but you can't intimidate them with like things that flash in the air. Um, uh, as far as persimmons go, uh, the Asian persimmons up until 2011 in the U.S. were fine in Zone 7. Uh, I mean, they're still fine in Zone 7 mostly. Zone 6 they won't go to. If you're in a solid Zone 7, like a, seven, a, a good Zone 7, you can grow pretty much most of the Asian persimmons, any of the Asian American cross persimmons, as well as the American persimmons. Uh, there's a few of the Asian persimmons that are going to be rated to zone eight, uh, but most of them will be fine in zone seven. I'll tell you uh, where we are at at Living Energy Farm is zone six. Charlottesville is 40 miles west of us, and that's zone seven, even though it's west of us. Usually it's colder west of us, but it's a pretty solid zone seven. I have about 35 varieties of Asian persimmons there, and I have never seen any damage on them. 
it'll go to zero there, zero degrees Fahrenheit, what we had last winter. The Saijo is fine, Great Wall, Tecumseh, I can go down the list. Gyro, Ichikike Gyro, uh, Hanafuyu, uh, uh, Wazifuyu, I've got a bunch of them. No damage whatsoever at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you get down to minus five or minus 10, they're going to they're gonna get all messed up. Uh, but if you're in a solid zone seven, if you stay above zero degrees Fahrenheit, you can grow almost anything. Now, there's a few of them like the, the, the Gyombo and I don't remember some of those others that are zone eight. Stay away from those. But anything, most of the rest of them, you'll be fine. OK, so here's um, an interesting question. Is it possible to get dwarf version of some of these trees and um, and then plant them on, on a roof garden? This question is from S. Massop. Yes. Uh, okay, so that gets into the grafting question. Now, there are two kinds of dwarfs. There's what's called a genetic dwarf, like a, a, a tree that just naturally doesn't get very big. Uh, so uh, a, uh, a Nikita's gift persimmon is a natural dwarf. A, uh, a North Star cherry is a natural dwarf. The Nikita's gift is even smaller than the uh, North Star cherry. So the Nikita's gift will only get about eight feet tall. So that's one kind of dwarf. The other kind of dwarf, when you graft a tree, uh, it is the rootstock that sets the size of the tree. Now we'll talk about this in more length next week with the propagation workshop. So if you look at apple rootstocks, for instance, there's a, a spectrum of, um, of uh, rootstocks. So for apples, it's the M7 and M9 that are dwarfing uh, rootstocks. And then they're semi-dwarf, which make kind of medium-sized trees. And then, it, so it's a spectrum. It goes on up until you get to full-size trees. So yes, it's not hard to dwarf these trees. For instance, with pear trees, they traditionally use quince rootstock uh, to dwarf the tree. Uh, my experience is, if you really are, you really want to do it on a rooftop garden, uh, the Nikita's gift would be great. It's a small tree, uh, like with the apples, the M7, M9 rootstock. It's a fairly weak rootstock. It's not going to make a very good tree. I don't recommend them. But if you're going to put it on a rooftop, you're going to give it really good soil, and you're going to stake it so the tree doesn't fall over. Yeah, you could do that. Um, Quince also, it makes a pear tree, but not a great pear tree. I really recommend people plant bigger trees. You can also prune the bejesus out of it. That's another. Now, what, what I would recommend uh, is, like, let's go for a pear tree. Instead of using a uh, quince rootstock, I would use what's called an OHXF333, which is a semi-dwarf rootstock. So it's not a full dwarf. It's a semi-dwarf. And then just prune the bejesus out of it. Prune it in the wintertime. Now, if you're doing a pear or an apple, make sure you leave some fruiting spurs. In other words, don't take the tip off of every branch. Uh, but look up, like, uh, study the espalier thing. That's where you spread a tree out and you keep it small. Uh, I do not like full dwarfing rootstocks. I tend to go for, like, a low-end semi-dwarf and then prune it back if I want a small tree. But it's the rootstock that sets the size of the tree. If you are going to do, like, an espalier or a small tree, you have to at least make sure you get a semi-dwarf or dwarf rootstock. If you get, like, a, a full-sized Rootstock. So for a pear, that would be a Beautifolia or Cali Rihanna or an OHX 97. Those are all big trees. And you tried to make that into a super small tree just by cutting it, by pruning it really hard. It wouldn't work very well. The tree would fight with you. You'd get the thing would just turn into grass. You'd have incredible sprouts all over the place. So you want to try to get a small rootstock is what you want to do. All right, everybody. I think uh, that would wrap up the question and answer session for right now. So everybody, thank you um, for for uh, hanging out with us. And Alexis, thank you very much. As always, uh, this was another amazing session. And we got a bunch of people saying thank you. Um, it was informative. So everybody got uh, a lot of value out of it. So um, Alexis, I'm going to give you the last word. And um, then I will move on to the um, uh, webinar highlights of the week. So. Uh, go for it, and then we'll say goodbye here. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. And next week, we're going to do a presentation on fruit tree propagation. We'll show you how to grow uh, fruit trees from seeds, how to root cuttings. And hopefully, I'm going to get a bunch of pictures together. I can show you in pretty intimate detail how to do grafting. Uh, so that will come up in a week. We'll look forward to seeing you there. All right. Thanks, everybody. And come back next week with Alexis.